Welcome to our Shepherd's Chapel Bible Study. It's great that you could join us again. And I thank everybody. I don't do this often, but I do thank you for being here and studying with us. And I know the Lord does. Please join us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the blessing that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. Our cups truly do runneth over. We owe you all good things, Father, and we thank you for protecting us and leading us and guiding us and directing us. We also have these unspoken prayers before you at this time. You know every heart, every need, every wish, every dream, every concern. And we thank you for not only hearing these prayers, but we thank you for always answering them in perfect season. Also, Father, we have these prayers before you. We pray for June. Dana, Jody, Jacob, Janet, Joan, Judy, Ross, Becca, Kim, Damon, and all those families who are struggling through this life, Father, that they turn to you and trust in you and rely on you and give their hearts to you. And as always, Father, we pray for all those past and present, wherever they are, whatever they are doing, we pray, dear Lord, that they're spending time in thy word and that they will return to the sheepfold soon. And as always, Father, we pray for Israel and our nation, for thy kingdom to come, for thy will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven, to which we say, come, Lord, come. And we know by all the devastation on this planet that it's coming soon, Father. And we do look forward, not to the tribulations necessarily, but we do look forward to thy coming and what we have to do in the meantime. And we pray, dear Lord, for those first responders every day that are on the front lines, helping your children, as well as we pray for our military who are in arms way or who are about to go into arms way for their safety and speedy return home. And as always, Father, we pray for the lost, those that do not have an opportunity this day to receive thy truth. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear thy words as it is written, as it will be you that speaks to us this day. In Yeshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, getting back into our Father's word, we're getting close to the conclusion of the second book of Corinthians this letter that Paul has written to Corinth. And um, today in chapter 12, we're getting a little bit more insight about what Paul's ministry and how the Lord has used him, of course, but also how what Paul thinks about certain things, certain matters, and how he himself conducts his ministry that the Lord has given him. You know, I guess all preachers and teachers uh, believe that they have what's called a calling, where our Lord has called them to service. But there are at times that people feel that they've been called, yet come to find out they themselves were the ones that wanted to do a thing in, in the ministry or something to do with it and God hasn't called them. Now how do we how do we know that? Because of I believe that when, when Christ literally calls you, he enables you to be able to study at a deeper level, to be able to teach at a deeper level and that's even in evangelism I mean yes evangelism is a whole different entity so to speak evangelism is where someone takes the Word of God and they they bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ that's their basically their sole purpose but with that being said it still takes Christ within them to be able to say the right words, to think the right thoughts, to be able to 
talk to someone on their level. So it takes the Holy Spirit within them that leads, guides, and directs them to talk with someone and to, to relate to them on, on whatever level they're dealing with. So that's a calling. That's a calling by our Father that but our Father gives them this this intuition, so to speak, of how to deal with certain things in, in all kinds of ministries, whether you're teaching milk as an evangelist or you're te teaching meat as a uh, doctrinal theologian. But the fact is, God does the calling. Well, how do we know whether a person has had the calling and has answered that call? Because the, the Word tells us many are called but few are chosen. And the reason they're not chosen is because they're not willing to go that extra mile, what it takes to study to show themselves approved in the Word of God so that they can be used as a tool of our Lord. Now Paul's going to be elaborating a little bit on this, starting right off in verse 1. And the reason I bring this forward is because back in the day, yes, they had, uh, when I say back in the day, I'm talking about Paul's time and in and, and Christ's time, uh, be, even before Christ's uh, death and resurrection. There were schools that people would go to, uh, synagogues, to uh, learn and to prepare themselves for, back then was the priesthood or the Pharisee or the Sadducee, and uh, they uh, in, in Jerusalem and other places. But they would, I guess, be called the hierarchies of learning the ancient scriptures, which would have been the Torah, the first five books. But we're going to come coming out right at the gate, we're going to realize that now Paul was a very intelligent person. He was schooled <coughs> in the ancient manuscripts. He, to the point where he, remember he said at one point, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. In other words, he followed the mark as Pharisees followed, which he come to learn was, many of it was traditions of men, what it came out to be. And he forsook that when Christ called him on the road to Damascus. But Paul was a learned person. He knew multiple languages. And he, he knew what it took to learn. To, to uh, learn whatever capacity of, of languages or what he was learning. And why do I bring this forward? Because we're going to see something very clearly here. That... Paul, teaching Christ's words, did not go to school, did not go to a seminary, did not go to a university. Of course, they didn't have universities back then. To learn. It came directly from our Lord. So with that being said, please pick up your Bibles with me. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 with verse 1 with wisdom from our Heavenly Father. And it reads, Paul speaks. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. Now, now glory means, means a, a high renown or, or honor. He it says, it, it, it's, not, it's not expedient for me to glory on myself, to brag about myself, to honor myself. He says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, Paul's giving us some insight here of how he receives. Again, he didn't, he didn't go... Remember, this is, Paul was called after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he was on the road to Damascus, and the Lord came to him. And he came to him, and he says, Why do you... Uh, uh, why do you uh, uh, what, what, what was the terminology? Why do you kick against the pricks? In other words, why... Why are you uh, going against my teachings? Why are you going against my church? Why are you going against my, my chosen uh, Christians? And uh, Paul had to learn from that point on, with all his knowledge, 
he had to learn how to rely on the Lord and the Lord alone. Now, how did the Lord give him all these words? Because basically, we're the most of the New Testament is from describing the writings from Paul's voice, but it came from the Lord. And how did Paul receive it? He's telling you here. He received these in visions and in revelations, where, where Christ would reveal to Paul what needed to be said. He would reveal to Paul where to go, what to do, uh, what to say, when to say it, when not to say some things. So this is very important for us to know and understand as a, uh, a Christian today. If you really want to walk with the Lord and, and be brutally honest and, 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 and do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it, we need to come to that anointing. But, of course, Christ is the one that brings the anointing. So if, if he does bring that to you, and I really believe that he, he gives an insight to us all, all who, who want it, all who call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to come into their lives and, and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. He will bring forth these revelations. He will bring forth these visions at times to lead, guide, and direct us. But it is up to us to accept it. Well, Paul had accepted these things, and now he's being utilized. So he brings this as, as a revelation to us of how it came to him. And, and I'm not, it sounds like I'm speaking against the cemeteries, I mean the seminaries, that, um, but I guess in a way I am in some cases. Because what I've seen in my lifetime, people have gone to these places and received information about the Bible, but they've never studied the entire Bible. There's not enough time. It's more about traditions. Well, I wouldn't even call it traditions. I would call it uh, their, their formats of what they decide to teach and how they teach it. And it's, it's their revelations. It's what they say. And, of course, they say that they have the information and the knowledge to give a student. But the problem I see with that and why I see that as a problem is because the students that I've seen, and I haven't seen students from every uh, uh, seminary, but the ones I have seen have gotten a lot of the doctrinal study that you can receive from our Lord in his word incorrect. They teach flyaway doctrine. They teach Easter instead of Passover. And, and a number of things that they get incorrect. And, and the reason they believe that is because that's what they taught. And the reason they taught is because that's what they believed was right. So until one goes to the Lord and to his word, to, that's why the Lord says, study to show thyself approved. You've got to do the studying. And if you do the studying, he does the revealing. So Paul gives us about a, a person, and, and he gives us an example here. Verse 2, I knew a man in Christ, he knew Christ, he loved the Lord, above 14 years ago, this is over 14 years ago I knew this person, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body. In other words, I don't remember if, 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 if I remember him as in the flesh or in the spirit. I cannot tell. God knows. God knoweth such as one caught up to the third heaven. So he knew, personally knew a, a, a man over 14 years ago that was called by Christ to the third heaven. Now, what is the third heaven? Well, to know that, you need to know and understand going all the way back to Genesis and even beyond. In other words, there's three world and there's three earth ages. It's the same world, it's the same earth, it's the same heaven. But they're different ages of time. The first world, first earth age is when we were all with our Lord and our, 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 our Father. And that's when uh, Satan, he wasn't called Satan back then, he was Lucifer. And he was a guardian cherub. 
that covereth the mercy seat. Well, he rebelled, remember, he, and we studied this in the Word of God. He rebelled, he turned against God, and he, he drew a third of God's children away from him. Well, that was the first earth, first heaven age. Now, what is the second earth and heaven age? You're living it. It's this world that we're living in today, this world age, this heaven age. Oh, well, what is the third? Is when we will all return to the eternal kingdom. That's the third earth. That's the third world age. Again, it's the same world. Well, it's a rejuvenated world on the third, but and it's the same heaven. But where is heaven? Wherever God is. But the point is, that's why he said the third heaven. Not that there's, and some people teach this, that there's three levels of heaven. No, that's, not, that's incorrect teaching. It means the third world, third earth, third heaven age. So this man, he knew 14 years ago, was called. Now, to, be, to go into that heaven, that's why Paul didn't know if he was in, in the body, in the flesh, or in the spirit, because to go into that realm you have to be in a spiritual body. Just like um, John in uh, Patmos, when Christ called him in the book of Revelation, called him to the eternal kingdom, he was brought to the third heaven age. That's not who he's talking about here, is it? This isn't John. Okay. No. He says, um, because this is written, this is written way before Patmos, mm. say. So, so, well, that's a good, that's a good question because... It just, it just revealed to me that there was one go to the third heaven age before John ever did. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, but see, Paul knew him. See, so it says in verse three, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Four, how that he was caught up into paradise. And, and, and why is he talking about this? This is what he says. And heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Not lawful for a man to speak. Why? It doesn't say why, does it? But why would you think it's unlawful for a man to speak? Because when you're in the eternity... You see things, you hear things that, I, I guess it's the, the best way I can describe it is that you, you can see all and that you know all. Past, present, and future. And there's, there's certain things about our future that we are not to be made aware of until it's time. Just like uh, Christ, when he was walking with the apostles, told them <coughs> about his death and resurrection. But they did not understand. Well, if we were to hear of someone that has gone to the third heaven age, and they would speak to us about certain things that was going to transpire, we ourselves wouldn't understand. So there's some things at this point, are kept from us. Um, and the best way I can feel about this is that because the Lord knows that we would probably go off half-cocked and just make a mess, more mess of things than what we're doing now. But again, it doesn't say. But unspeakable things, that's not lawful or, or, or not permitted for a man to speak. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Back in the day... Um, was was there scriptures like the Torah that that they only spoke of in the temple? Well, back in the day, as you call it, that's really probably ninety nine percent of the time the Torah was spoken was in not just the temple but synagogues mm -hmm. as well, because. Not everybody could read. Hardly anybody could read. Mm -hmm. So they would need to go to the synagogues and go to the, to the rabbis, the teachers, to hear the word of God. Mm -hmm. So that's, does that answer your question? Yeah, because I'm thinking lawful in, in, in accordance to God's law, 
rather than a legal aspect. Well, I could I no, I, I don't think that God would ever disallow someone to hear his word. Okay. Uh, but back in the day, many people could not read and write, so mm -hmm. they would have to go to these places to hear the word of God. Okay. But why does he bring this up? Well, he says in verse 5, of such and one, that, that, that man they knew 14 years ago that was called up into the third heaven, of such and one will I glory. In other words, that kind of person is high renowned. That kind of person I can honor. Why? Because Christ himself called him to the third heaven. So why does he say, say that? Yet of myself, I will not glory. But in mine infirmities, my weaknesses. Now, what is he saying here? Look, <clears throat> I'm not going to honor myself. Now, now, could Paul have? I guess so. I mean, this man was given the gift of prophecy. This man was given the gift of the knowledge and wisdom of God. This man was given the gift of healings. Through Christ Jesus, of course. But... He could have puffed himself up very easily, but Paul said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to honor myself. I'm not going to glory in myself. But what I am going to glory about, about myself, is my weaknesses. Now, a person is going to say, why in the world would someone honor themselves by all the weaknesses that they have? Well, Paul's going to enlighten us on this. Listen, six. For though I would desire to glory, I would desire to, to, to honor and, and, and uh, uh, high renown, I should not be a fool. I'm not, I'm not going to fall into that trap. For I will say the truth. I'm going to tell you like it is. I'm going to put where the rubber meets the road here. But now I forbear. Lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be. I don't want them to look at me higher than where I deserve to be. Or that he heareth of me. I don't want anybody to put me on any kind of pedestal. I don't deserve to be there. The only one that deserves to be there is Christ and Christ alone. 7. And lest I should be exalted or lifted up above measure... Through the abundance of the revelations. I mean, he's given all this information from Christ. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The, and now hear this. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, to bruise me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, what is Paul saying here? He's saying, look, i got a problem. I've got a problem in my life, and, and, and he's come to learn something about this problem, this difficulty that he has in life. Now, let's not forget, Paul's been shipwrecked, he's been snake bit, he's been, he's been stoned, he's been thrown into prison, he's been beaten to the inch of his life, and, and all these infirmities he calls a blessing because they were for the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's one thing in his life that he can't shake. Now, what is that one thing? Well, there's different schools of thought. One of them is that uh, we do know that Paul had poor eyesight. Now, uh, we do know that he was a learned man, and he went through all kinds of training and, and study. So there was a point in his life that he could see, I guess, see very well. Because uh, they didn't have any Braille institutes back in the day. Well, he wasn't blind, but he, it was very hard for him to see. And how do we know that? Because there's certain passages in the Word of God where he, he says, I, Paul, will, will write, write my name so that, that you know this letter is coming from me. But when he wrote it, he wrote it in big letters. And Paul did not, per se, write these books. He, he um, spoke these words from Christ through him. But they were scribed by Luke and other people, a lot by Luke, that would write, scribe out these, these letters. So Paul may have thought that this was a big infirmity in his life where, where he couldn't do it himself. He had to rely on someone else to help him. That's one school of thought. 
The other school of thought is that Paul uh, felt that he never forgave himself for persecuting the Christian church. Remember, he was the one that held the coats of those that were stoning Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church. And he, remember, on the road to Damascus, he had the letters where he was going to go out to persecute, pers continue to persecute the Christian church. So some feel that he never forgave himself. That's another school of thought. But the bottom line here is, it doesn't say this particular moment of what this infirmity is. Only that it was a thorn in his side. Now how, how bad was it? Well, this is what he says. Number one in verse seven, he says that the reason this happens, and he realizes, lest I should be exalted above measure. In other words, if I didn't have this infirmity, I guess even though I've been shipwrecked and all this other stuff, life would be perfect. In other words, my, my body would be perfected. But I got this problem in my life. I can't get rid of it. Listen, verse 8. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice. I, I've, I've gone to the Lord three times on this. That it might depart from me. So he's serious about this. It's a problem in his life. Now think about what he's saying here. Now Paul could pray to the Lord in the, in the Lord's name, the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and, and heal people and, and uh, cure leprosy and, 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 and infirmities and, and all kinds of diseases. And they would be healed in the Lord Jesus Christ's name, of course. It would be the power and the authority of Christ. But Paul was doing this for himself. He asked the Lord three times. But what's important, the Lord did answer him, but, but this is what the Lord says. And I want you to hear this very well. Verse 9. And he said unto me, in other words, the Lord said to me, My grace, my unmerited favor, that's what grace means. My grace is sufficient. My grace is enough for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now hear those words. My strength is made perfect in weakness. That, mean, that doesn't mean Christ is weak. That means we are weak. And it says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, glory in my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, if you really understand that, how can you ever doubt? How can you ever face calamity, infirmities, how can you both sickness, you? weakness? Mm -hmm. We know a, a person right now, I'll give you an example, right as we speak, one of our beloved parishioners, is succumbing to cancer. And this cancer, did we pray for her healing and the cancer to be removed? Of course we have. And we're still praying. But the point being is, she's at this point, unless the Lord changes his mind, she's going home in very short order. It's not very much longer now. And But why do I bring this up? Is because of what she believes in. Now see, let me tell you something. We pray all the time. We say we love the Lord all the time. We say we're going to follow Him. We, we say a lot of things. But where push comes to shove is when you're laying on your deathbed. All the prayers of your life, all the sayings of your life, comes down to that moment. And that's where the rubber meets the road in your life. Now, at that point, you come to a conclusion in your life whether you truly believe in what you've learned all your life or however long it's been since you've been a Christian. Do you really believe that you're going into the eternity because you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe in all the things that you've read and studied? Or don't you? 
Well, see, she does. Now, is she going through pain? Yes, and I hate it for her. And, and there's no doubt that, I mean, there's drugs in this world that can alleviate, to the most part, pain. But let me tell you something, folks. Even with those drugs, there's still pain. There's still suffering. But when you're going through that and you can say from your mouth that God is God, that the Lord is the Lord of your life, and that you love the Lord. Now, her biggest concern is that she, she, she's concerned about her family. She's concerned about her kin and their, their, their continuation and, and their lives, that they have good lives. Now think about that. That's a person lying on their deathbed, not thinking about themselves, but thinking about others. Now don't tell me for one instant that they're not of the Lord, and the Lord is with them. Why do I bring all this up? This is the same thing what Paul's trying to relate to us, is that in our weaknesses, God is strong. When we have pains, I've had pains in my arms and my legs and my back and wherever. But I've never forsaken my, never forsaken the Lord, no matter how much pain I'm going through. And why do I bring up the, the uh, about uh, our parishioners? Because that's the ultimate. That's I mean, when you're facing the the transition from flesh existence to eternity. That's where the rubber meets the road. And what our Father wants you to know and understand is that this is where you need to be. This is where you need to learn to be at all times. So when that does come, and I, unless you've never heard this before, this may be a shock to some of you, but none of us get out of this alive. We're all going to succumb. These flesh bodies stop existing eventually there's going to come a day that you're going to have to face this yourself so be prepared for it and this is what our Lord wants you to do today be prepared now so he says again in verse 9 Christ says to Paul and to you and to me my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now don't ever forget that. Verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, Paul says. I take pleasure in infirmities, in, in my weakness, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So he, he come to that revelation, he come to that understanding. When I'm weak, I'm strong. Why? It's not that I'm strong. Christ is strong in me. He lifts me up. He, 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 he covers me. He protects me. He leads me. He guides me. He directs me. Because I'm looking towards him. That's another thing, too. When we're at our weakest, do we not look to him more than when we're up high on the mountain and nothing's going wrong? Now, we should look at him and give him praise and glory then as well. But when you're at your weakest, <coughs> when, it, when you're, at your, you're having difficulties, do you not, are you not more in tune to him at that time? Yes. What I started to say earlier is we, we, we don't boast in ourselves. Because when we boast in ourselves, there's no room for Christ in us. Yes, we don't boast in ourselves, but that's really another another avenue that Paul was taking just prior to this. We're talking about actual infirmities. We're talking about actual difficulties that people are experiencing. Pain, sorrow, suffering. And what the Lord wants us to understand, when we're facing those things, when we're at our weakest moments in life, the, the, the most horrendous feelings that we can have, Christ is with us 
at that moment, mm -hmm. seeing us through it. We're not doing it on our own. Well, maybe boast was the wrong word, uh, complaining. We don't complain about what we're going through. Well, that's the point. And, and that's they what you, human flesh nature does want to complain. Mm -hmm. Whenever anything happens that's negative to us, we want to complain, and we do. But our Lord wants us to realize, what's that going to do? Just give you a big pity party? Because that's what, that's what you're having at that point. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, to make your, your infirmities, your weaknesses, your struggles not important. They are important. They're especially important to you because you're going through them. But what our Lord wants us to know that he, He's stronger with you when you're going through them. But you've got to look to Him. You've got to trust in Him no matter how bad it gets. No matter how bad you think it is. That He's there with you and going through it. And He's going to get you through it. Nothing will happen to you. Nothing that hasn't already happened before. There's nothing new under the sun. May be new to you, but it's happened to many, many people. Now, some people go through it well, and some people do not go through it well. And that depends whether or not they're walking with Christ or not. And that's the whole point of this, isn't it? To be walking with Christ at all times? 11. I have become a fool in glory, praising myself. Ye have compelled me, talking about the Corinths. For I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostle or apostles, though I be nothing, though 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 I'm I'm not puffing myself up, but even the chiefest apostle, I'm no less than they are. I'm no greater than they are. But he's saying, look, when I, when I look to myself, when I, when I look to, to my accomplishments, I'm a fool. Because without Christ, I'm nothing. Without his power and authority, I'm nothing. I could not have gone through what I've gone through without him. And, he, and he's just revealed to me that his grace... His unmerited favor in my life is sufficient. I don't need anyone or anything else. I need him. You know, and that doesn't mean that we don't love our spouses and, and our children and all that. I'm not saying that you don't we don't we don't want our families. I'm talking about when we're talking about eternity, when we're talking about your creator, there's no one or no thing that can come between you and him. Period. He's the one that will lift you. He's the one that gave you your family. He's the one that keeps your family going. So he's the one that should get the credit. Not glorying in yourself for what you've done or what you've accomplished. Because without him, you have not accomplished a thing. And this is where a lot of people do. They glory in themselves. That's why we have the mess that we have in this world today. All these people are puffing themselves up, thinking that their stuff don't stink. Well, it does. And badly. Well, in, in leaning on the Lord and having Him in our lives, we've spoken on this before, that it enables us to love one another better. It enables us to serve one another better because we're not putting ourselves first. That's We're true. putting Christ first and then each other after that. Verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought or were performed among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. I mean, all these, these things happened before you. You saw what the apostles were able to accomplish. But, of course, it was always in Jesus Christ's name. It was his authority. It was his power utilizing the apostles as tools to get his, his, his uh, vision across, his ministry, his, ministry, his, his gospel across. 13. For what is it wherein 
ye were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you, question. Forgive me this wrong. Now what Paul's talking about here is that I have not yet visited you as much as I want. I, I went there once, but I've gone to all these other churches. I established these other churches, and I haven't come back. Like, And I've told you a couple times I was going to come back, and I haven't been able to come back yet because the Lord had other works for me to do. And uh, he says, I'm sorry about this. I haven't been able to make it. But that doesn't mean that I think less of you and that that I, I, I feel that you're not worthy of my visit. That's, that, he's saying that's not the case. You know, you're just as important to me as all of God's children. 14, behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. This is the third time now I'm, re I'm ready to go. And I will not be burdens burdensome to you. I will not be a trouble to you. For I seek not yours, but you. In other words, uh, not, not, uh, I'm not seeking those that I'm talking against. In other words, those false teachers, those false preachers that are disrupting and causing all kinds of problems, I'm not there seeking them. I'm there, when I come, I'm going to be seeking you. For the children are not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. In other words, that's how he looked as 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 a minister for the Christian church that uh, Christ established through Paul, as that he was the parent, he was their their guardian, so to speak, and they were the children. That's how he looked at them as as, as God's children, yes, but they were his children. He established the church through Christ Jesus, of course, but. He realizes that there's all, all this negative stuff going on behind the scenes. Behind, you know, and try, every time he writes a letter, uh, it doesn't take long before the naysayers, the false teachers, false preachers come out and say, well, look, they pick, pick and choose what they want in the letter, and they say, well, Paul's not this and Paul's not that. He's not here. He should be here. We, they say all kinds of things. And the problem with that is, that people, and still today, people will listen to people that are in front of them. In other words, you got all these ministries today. Oh, there's thousands of them that people go to. Now they're physical buildings. They're physical so-called ministers. And it looks so whole, stained glass, or whatever the case may be, and the music, and and the prayers and all these wonderful things that seem to be taking place and that's in our presence so and we go and we go and week after week month after month year after year so we start relying on what we can see what we can touch what we can feel what we hear from them but the problem lies is if they're not teaching from the Word of God chapter by chapter, verse by verse, line by line, precept by precept. They're not teaching truth. They're making up stories as they go along. Oh, they sound wonderful. Wonderful testimonies and mission trips and mission fields and all these wonderful... They sound so good. But the thing is, when you go outside the churches... And the world hits you right in the face and you can't deal with it. And you fall into the traps of the world. And you start listening to television and, and, and programs and you start behaving badly and talking badly and thinking badly. There's something missing in your life. There's, there's something that, that you're not getting. Well, what you're not getting is being fed the Word of God. See? So... You keep going and you keep going to a situation that's not helping you, but hindering you. And it is God and God alone, His, His Word and His Word alone 
that reveals the truth to you on how to deal with the world. Because that's what this whole book does. It teaches you how to deal with Satan, his, his cronies, his dominion, his, his, and, and, and all the negatives of, of this life. It teaches you how to deal with it God's way. And then you find yourself having those visions, having those revelations, not from a stick-built church, but from God, from Christ himself. And then once you get these revelations and you get these visions from him, all of a sudden things are just so much clearer to you of why things are the way they are and that they're going to hell in a handbasket. And it's not that you can't do anything. As a matter of fact, now you have the power and the authority to do something about it, to stay away from it, to put it in its place of where it belongs. And that's away from your heart and your mind and your soul. And the only way that can happen is when you come to Christ and Christ alone. And I'm not saying every church in this land is a bad place to be. But if they're not teaching the Word of God as it is written, because when you go to church, you should be able, it should be a house of prayer and a house of study. And when you study, you should be able to study enough to the point to where you yourself can teach it to somebody else. And I'm not saying we're all going to be ministers and preachers and teachers, but we all are going to be ambassadors. And we will be able to tell others how our lives have changed from where we were to where we are today when we are following Christ. And that's what all this is all about. Verse 15, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. In other words, what I do, I do for you, not against you even though some may think contrary. And I can assure you, the more you know, the more is required of you. And as you do more for the Lord and His children, there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to look at you negatively. See, I was looking at this monetarily. Like it would be burdensome to them through, no. you know, them taking care of Him financially. But that's not it at all. That's not it at all. No, mm -hmm. it's not. It's not monetary. It's 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 people just get so wrapped up into their own little worlds and whatever those worlds are. Some, I mean, like I said, some people. Now we're not talking about the heathen here. Basically, we're talking about those Christ-loving, church-going folks that are going today, week after week, month after month, year after year. And they're, they're supposed to be receiving the Word of God, and they're not. That's the problem. I'm not saying they hear one or two verses. One or two verses is a wonderful thing. But just hearing one or two verses a week, how long is it going to take you to get through the Word of God? And then they flip through that book and go to that book and they flip through that book and they got your constant and, and a lot of places today don't even require you to even bring your Bible. They'll put out what Murray says a rag sheet out there for you to read off a piece of paper and they'll put it up on the big screen. No. The Lord says study to show thyself approved. You do the studying. Let me tell you something. You start that and your life will change. Now some people might say well Pastor, I don't know how to study. You know what? Your teacher will teach you how to study. And who's your teacher? The Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said in verse 1, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. How did that happen? Because it came from the Lord. And Paul's telling you, this can happen to you if you trust in the Lord. The bottom line is, do you or don't you? Well, I... I pick up the word and I, there's some things I don't understand. Okay, then pray about it. Research it. Think it over. No, use the, the tools that I've told you about. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Uh, the, the, the Bollinger Companion Bible. 
uh, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, those three items, let me tell you something, will open up the Word of God to you. Because the Father will see that you're, you're serious about that. You want to study. Now, will God just, will you just snap your fingers and God give you all the revelation and visions of, of the eternity? No. It doesn't work that way. He wants you to study to show thyself approved. Just like I've said many times, you are what you eat. You eat every day to have your body function. You need to study every day to have your soul function. But, verse 16 says, But be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Now what does that mean? That as he would talk to them, as he would write to them, he would lift them up, but he did so with the visions and the clarity of Christ and that he found out that there was sin among them. He found out even though he was giving them uh, the, the blessings of truth that they were turning in some degree, turning away from that truth. So he says in verse 17, Did I make a gain of you by any of them who, whom I sent unto you? In other words, did any I send to you rip you off? Did they go to you just to, to take your money and run? Or did they come and bring you truth? So he says in 18, I desired Titus. I, I sent Titus. And with him I sent a brother. Remember, two or more. You know, double witness. Did Titus make a gain of you? Did, did he take advantage of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? In other words, wasn't it as if I was there myself? Walked we not in the same steps? In other words... He's not teaching you anything differently than I taught you. Now, here's what, what Paul's trying to say. Look, when, when I send these brothers to you, they're teaching the same thing. But these false teachers and false preachers that you guys have been re listening to, they're not teaching the same thing. They're twisting and turning it. See, that's why it's so important to study the Word of God for yourself. When you study the Word of God for yourself, you can go into any place of so-called worship and find out very quickly whether or not they are teaching the truth or not. Because if they are not aligning to the Word of God as it is written, they're false teachers. Now, I'm not saying you need to stand up in their places and call them false teachers, but you get out of there, knock the dust off your sandals, and you don't go back unless God leads you to for whatever reason. Maybe it might be for one soul there to talk to them. I don't know. But you follow what the Lord gives you to do. But I'm telling you right now, the Lord's not going to lead you into a place of so-called worship if they are not teaching the truth. The one that you're following in that case is yourself, not God. There's a lot of places you can go and get a feel-good message. A lot of places. What do they call them? Um, what's the word? It doesn't come to me. Where, where? You just, you just get a good, you know, positive, positive message, you know. And everything's good and everything's grand and everything's wonderful. And it can be. Well, what's going to happen when you go outside the doors and the world hits you in the face? And you're dealing with Satan. You're dealing with negativity. You're dealing with evil. You're just supposed to smile and grin? How long do you think that's going to last for you? How... How well are you going to be able to deal with that when someone, God forbid, ever breaks through your door and wants to ravage your family? Smile? Say, the Lord Jesus loves you? You'll be able to wake up into eternity the next morning, in some cases. Now, why do I say that? Because this world's evil. And you've got to learn how to deal with that evil. Yes, with love and compassion. 
But when love, sometimes that love and compassion is a hard stick to protect you and your family. That's the way it is. That, that's not saying you're not of God. Some people want to do away with our military, do away with our policemen, do away with our border controls, do away with all kinds of things, and just let this world go to hell in a handbasket. Oh, they won't turn that way. It's already that way. You think it's going to get better when you take away control and discipline? When Christ himself returns, is he coming as a babe, smiling, saying, I love you? Or is he coming, as the word says, with a rod of iron? What does that mean? He's coming with discipline. Because this world needs discipline. We need order and discipline. And he loves us. He will always love us. But he also, those he loves, he corrects. And how hard is that correction? Well, it depends on your disobedience. How hard he needs to get. Sometimes I've been given just a, a love tap, and sometimes I've gotten a swift kick in the rear, so to speak, spiritually speaking. And I needed it. And it was all from love of, from God. So don't let man, don't let these traditions of men fool you into something that's not real. See, God deals with reality. And he wants you to understand the reality of the way things are and how to deal with them properly. I'm not saying you need to be a, a gun-toting, you know, lay claymores out in your yard kind of person. Bible thumping. Well, no, Bible thumping. Your not mother. necessarily Bible thumping. I'm talking about those that are scared to death of the world so they, 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 they put up ammo. There's a lot of people today that believe that we're all going into war against ourselves. A lot of people really believe that. And they're hoarding ammunition, they're hoarding yeah. firearms, and, and let me tell you something. When you got God on your side, you are going to make the right decisions. And he's going to make sure. Now, I don't know about, about a lot of you, but all those in a congregation know, yes, I carry concealed carry. Why do I do that? to protect my loved ones and those around me. And I pray to God, I pray every day of my life, I'll never have to use it. But I don't want to go through life worried that I need to use something and it's not there. My prayer is that, God forbid, if I ever have to shoot, that God will point the bullet. Now some people may just turn me off right now for that. But it's the gospel, it's the truth. And I pray I never have to use it. There's many police officers go through 20 years of service that never draw their firearm or never fire their firearm. And I'm pray I'm just like one of them. But some, and I'm not saying everybody needs a firearm today. What I'm saying is that you do what the Lord leads you to do, and do it well, according to His Word. According to his word, 19. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ. We don't go to man. We don't go to traditions. We speak to God. But we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying, for your building up. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Do you think I'm here just because I want to be here? I'm compelled to be here. I Believe me, in my flesh body, I don't know how many times I've thought, you know, what am I doing this for? Nobody seems to really care. That's my flesh speaking. Be perfectly honest with you. I don't know how many times I've almost quit doing this. But Christ in me compels me and teaches me. It's a need. It's a need that needs to be out there for God's children. And it's not to build myself up. It's to build you up in the Word of God. And this is how we need to deal with every single person we ever come in contact with. That we don't deal with people to tear them down. That's what's that's so rampant today. Pretty evident, isn't it? 
People are trying to tear each other down for whatever their reasons are. But when you learn this, when you understand this, when you learn what it means to truly walk with Christ, what you do in life is try to build another person up, to lift them up, lift them out of their, their whatever tragedy or th negative thinking that they're in at the time, and help them. I think, th you know, what comes to mind is, again, I bring up the, the, the lady that... Uh, is, is is going through the transition of dying of cancer to go visit her what can you say what what what, what can you say to a person that that is in the process of going from a flesh existence to eternity and and going there and just saying to them well I'm I'm praying for you and I don't mean to make light of that, because that's all some people know what to say. But what about allowing the Spirit of God to speak through you and actually making them feel better before you leave by what words are spoken? And I'll tell you right now, I go to these situations and I don't know what to say. You know, it's, it's like I've said that, I've been there, I've done that over and over again with other people. But when the Spirit in you comes out, it goes forward to that other person and they actually feel better than when you, before you walked in. That's lifting them up, even in a condition of the dying process of the flesh body. Now that's something to be grateful for. To give glory and honor and praise. Because that comes from God and God alone. He's the only one that can do that. But to do that, you've got to be a recipient of the Holy Spirit. You've got to be a, in a position. He's not going to come to people that, that could care less about him or anything he stands for. Why should he? They don't, they don't want anything to do with him. Well, why should he have anything to do with them? The Lord says... You forsake me, I forsake you. Well, some people don't, don't believe that. Well, then you don't believe what the Word says. You don't believe what our Father says. He's just basically saying, look, I, I'm going to give you what you want. You don't want no part of me? Fine. You don't have to. But don't expect me to lead God and direct you when you don't want to hear from me. Verse 20, for I fear, this is what Paul fears, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would. In other words, I'm worried that what I hear about you may not be all what I'm hearing, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not. In other words, I, I also fear that you say uh, about me, but when I get there, you're going to look at me differently. Lest there be debates, envies, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, a bunch of negativity going on. 21 to complete the chapter. And lest, when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be well many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanliness and fornication and lasciviousness, that's, that's the sensual desires which they have committed. So what's Paul saying here? Look, I, I, I fear that when I get there, it ain't all going to be rosy. That I'm going to have to come in and I'm going to have to deal with all this sin and corruption. Now why does he fear this? Because I think it's godly discernment within him that when, you, when you're away... And you got all these false teachers and false preachers that these people are looking towards 
and listening to and following, when he gets back there, he's going to have to deal with all the negativity that people are cropped up with. I mean, like today, you know, let's say you, 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 you start teaching and people are following the Word of God as it is written, and, and they're learning the truth about Passover, they're learning the truth about Feast of Tabernacles, they're learning the truth about uh, the three world ages and how to deal with this world and what's happening in this world, uh, the um, reap, religion, education, economy, and political systems, the four hidden dynasties of this world. And they come to this truth, knowledge, and understanding, but then they depart. And they go their separate ways. They go different avenues. And they start listening to this person and that person and that church and that per And they're following that, that theology and that theology. Next thing you know, they're back into worshiping Easter. They're back into worshiping uh, flyaway doctrine. They're back into doing all these negative things that is not of the Word of God. That's what Paul's fearing. And that's what I fear. That's what I fear for everyone that stops studying the Word of God daily. That's why it's so important daily to study, to show thyself approved, and to follow what the Word says. To not be hearers only of the Word, but to be doers of the Word. And if you are doers of the Word, you will succeed. Not only in this life, but the life to come. Any questions? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of today. We thank you for your word that you shared with us this day, that you bring forth these visions, these revelations to us, these, this understanding of your truth, that you reveal to us the truth, the nitty-gritty of what it means to truly be a Christian. And, and to to listen to you and to follow you. I pray for everyone here today and their families and all those on YouTube and their families that you watch over us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. And forevermore we will give you all glory, honor, and praise. For we do love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, and with all our souls. For it is in Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory.